seems to be partially with us. And Senator I'm sure Porter. he'll join us completely pretty soon. Okay, we are live. Um, Senate Government Operations on Thursday, June 11th. And, and just to kind of set the stage here a little bit for what we're going to do, we have a lot of people who are who have been invited, a lot of people who are interested in the topic. So I, we thought the way we would do this is to, um, Commissioner Sherling is under a time constraint, so we're going to hear from him first, and he's going to give us a, a high-level overview of the draft proposal that they've been working on and some of the concerns that they have. Then we'll hear from Betsy Ann Rask um, about the what we've already done around law enforcement and equity. And then we'll hear, um, we'll have a, a committee conversation about breaking down, breaking this down into categories because it will get too confusing if we're doing kind of everything at once. And that's what, when we do bills, we try to break it down that way so that we can focus on one topic and settle on that and then another instead of mixing them all up. And then starting tomorrow, and we'll hear from some people today if we have some time. And then starting tomorrow, we're going to be listening to people on these different categories and we'll um, put on the, the agenda which categories we'll be dealing with on which days. Does that make sense, committee? Okay, great. So with that, um, Commissioner Sherling, would you like to, <coughs> And I, I should say that this is an issue that, this isn't something that just happened and that people are just beginning to think about. This is something that people have been thinking about for a long time. And as you'll hear when um, Betsy Ann talks about it, we've been doing a number of things for a number of years, and but it's all been kind of brought to the, to the uh, head or the brought, up before us in a more immediate way right now because of recent events, not recent events in Vermont, but recent events around the country. So with that, Commissioner Sherling, would you like to um, join us? Certainly, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I had a, a fairly uh, lengthy introduction to kind of set the stage, but uh, I, I think in the interest of time and to ensure that others have an opportunity to weigh in as much as possible, I'll abbreviate that. Uh, and I'm willing to come back uh, on the topic specific uh, areas to elaborate further. Um, I appreciate Good. you taking me first as we're, um, we're continuing to work uh, through various crises at the same time um, with COVID taking uh, still a, a bulk of our time uh, in parallel with this. Um, the, just a brief piece of context. I think you set the stage well. This is work that's been going on for a long time. Uh, the pace has not been fast enough uh, and this is an opportunity and a, a point of inflection where accelerating the pace of change and accelerating our, our efforts at modernizing what we do in policing and in criminal justice more broadly, and as a society even more broadly, um, is essential. So, uh, the, it, so for background, just so people are, are sort of aware of the, the, the overarching, um, context for all of this. There are over a thousand police officers in Vermont. There are typically about 1500 events that are responded to on a daily basis. So it's a lot of contact with Vermonters. It's a lot of contact with uh, people visiting Vermont. Um, it is probably the most forward facing uh, high intensity government operation uh, that we have. Um, so with that as the backdrop, we've been working for years, decades really, I've been doing this for more than 30 years uh, to accelerate uh, the work of fair and impartial policing, of modernization, of uh, policy updates, of new equipment, of new ways of doing business, and, and really using a, uh, a, a model where there's continuous improvement. But that still hasn't been enough. Um, we've worked in partnership with community on a variety uh, of different initiatives, and we continue to do so. But again, it's still not enough. Uh, so what we have taken the, the time to do uh, both earlier this year and accelerating that work now is to outline modernization strategies that we think uh, will push uh, progress forward at a more rapid pace. Uh, you'll recall that 
uh, earlier this year in January, uh, we outlined the historic nature of uh, under-resourced public safety, including training and technology in a variety of other areas, ranging from mental health and social service provision, uh, and just a wide range of things. We proposed a suite of modernization initiatives and a three-year budget stabilization effort. None of those things proposed expanding the traditional way law enforcement is done. It's not about adding officers to the street, although we could make an argument that in some instances we are, we are short on the, the, the numbers to, to get the job done. But rather we propose modernizing training, data systems, expanding mental health and social service field teams, street outreach like teams in partnership with the communities, with the Department of Mental Health and the Department of Corrections. We've put forth a model of the criminal justice system in that modernization strategy that has four levels where the best dollar invested is in prevention and education and then outreach and intervention and then alternative sanctions, alternatives to traditional corrections and traditional adversarial uh, criminal justice. And then when all else fails, uh, delivering uh, a, a more traditional but more nuanced and effective criminal justice system. So all those things have been on the table for months, even before uh, the most recent crisis uh, was precipitated by uh, events outside Vermont. Um, in addition to that, we have now um, very rapidly uh, gotten together with uh, the Criminal Justice Training Council, the Chiefs Association, the Sheriff's Association, and the Attorney General's Office, and crafted an even more robust suite of reforms that we think um, matches very closely uh, what our community is looking for. Important to note that this is a very preliminary draft. It was done, it was created in part with community partners uh, and the fair and impartial policing uh, teams that we work with on a day-to-day -day basis, but it is not the end point. It is not the final proposal. It's the starting point for engaging you, engaging the community, uh, engaging all of our communities and as many stakeholders as possible to uh, refine these strategies and, and really do what policing is supposed to do, which is be reflective of our communities and to, uh, to police with communities to achieve, to, to achieve safety and health. And uh, it's not about what uh, police departments do to communities. It's what police departments should be doing with communities as an extension of the social standards and the social norms that are set by, in our case, Vermont. Uh, so all of the work that we're uh, accelerating now has to be done uh, with many stakeholders gaining uh, much more um, robust feedback uh, and it has to be more nuanced than we've presented so far. But with that as the backdrop, uh, I think uh, it makes sense to just walk through very briefly the, uh, the outline. Uh, I'm, I'm going to hold uh, on discussing the, the original modernization strategy any further. Um, but of note that is uh, back in the committee's hands and, and likely posted, I imagine, to a uh, legislative website. So others who are listening in can see the, um, the, the overarching modernization strategy we've been talking about uh, since the beginning of the legislative session. Um, I think I'll pause there for any questions or direction from the committee and then uh, absent any, I will move into the, the, the 10 areas that we've begun to focus, um, well, that's, that's inaccurate. We're continuing focus on and accelerating the work uh, on at the same time. So what you're um, going to be going over with us now is the law enforcement reform recommendations draft? Yes, that's okay. correct. Are there, committee, do you, are there any questions for the commissioner before he gets into the, Brian? Thank you, Madam Chair. I, just, I was trying to copy down notes, Mike. Um, you said there's over a thousand officers and I think you said 1,500 responses each day? That's correct. Uh, okay. On the low end, it's in the 11 or 1200 range. Uh, on the high end, it can approach 2000 uh, total calls for service uh, in a given day. Thank you. Uh, this, the state police, for example, uh, handle about 117,000 events a year, which results in several hundred thousand uh, contacts with the public. Thank you. Any other uh, questions, Commissioner? Sorry, Commissioner. That's okay. I'll, I'll, actually, I may come back to the point I was just to, about to make anyway, sure. uh, in terms of timing. So 
I, I won't go line by line and read this uh, four page document to you. And important to note, we've received feedback even since uh, I sent the most recent update this morning. So this is an iterative document. It's constantly being updated as we get community feedback. Um, and there we are going to work on an engagement process uh, with the community, but we want to ensure that the community is driving that. So um, we're not, uh, we're being very mindful about uh, how to do that. So you haven't seen announcements on an engagement process because we don't want to get ahead of our partners in the community. Uh, mm -hmm. But we are ready to work at a pace that is rapid. So um, the, the areas uh, that we've identified, again, collectively with the community based on feedback and areas that we've been working on, in some cases for years, uh, hiring practice uh, to ensure that uh, departments are reflective, uh, not only of the community, but of the community we want to attract uh, to Vermont, and that we're being very proactive about the types of people we're looking for. And we're very deliberate about um, the kinds of candidates, the types of traits and skills that we want them to have. And oftentimes that's going to be non-traditional. Uh, and then within that, um, and, and when I, I should be clear what I mean by non-traditional. Uh, historically, if you go back 30 years, many of the folks coming into law enforcement were coming from either a criminal justice specific uh, background or the military. And we get great candidates from those areas, but you don't want an organization to um, be over dependent on any one kind of training or background. You want it to be as diverse as possible. And I say that with a small d, diverse in terms of, um, of race, of ethnicity, of skill sets, of background, uh, of age, all those things create more uh, stronger organizations. So without spending too much time here uh, on each one, because it would take an, uh, an inordinate amount of the committee's time, uh, there's a number of action items we've preliminarily identified that will help us to accelerate the process of modernizing uh, hiring. And I'm happy to take, uh, if you want me to pause on each one for questions that that may make sense rather than trying to mold them all together. So um, committee, I'm not sure how you would like to proceed here. What we're going to do is we're going to take these same um, categories that you've outlined here and we're going to deal with them more in depth at a separate time. Like tomorrow we might do hiring practice and training. We're, we'll figure out so that we don't try to get people testifying in general terms, but to very specific issues. And I should just say that um, a lot of this does not need legislation. Um, and wherever possible, uh, if, if there is legislation needed, we're happy to do that. Um, we've been instructed by the pro tem to, that if there is legislation needed, we should um, scurry around and get it get it developed and get it out. So we do have permission, but a lot of it may not need that. But committee, are there any questions on on the hiring practice so far? I don't have that kind of a question. I, do, do we have a copy of this somewhere? The four page document? Do yes, we have it's posted on our, on today's. Yeah. Okay. It's posted on today's, uh, if you look under documents for today. Okay. It's listed there. It's called, uh, it's the first under, commissioner's name. There's three documents under his name and it's the first one. It's called law enforcement something draft. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, you actually brought up a point that I had, uh, I was about, was going to make before I got into here, but uh, into the document, but uh, it, it's a, a perfect placeholder. Um, not all of these things do require legislation. I'm sensitive to the fact though that police departments do require oversight. And, uh, and accountability. And these things are designed to create more accountability. And I am also cognizant that the legislature may want specific accountability by police departments around Vermont to certain standards. And I would offer that uh, as we've thought very intently about this uh, since the beginning of the year, um, one of the ways that that may be most viable is rather than spelling out specific nuanced policy and statute. 
which creates a rigidity that uh, makes it more difficult actually to create uh, ongoing improvement because we'd have to come back and revisit the legislation. If the legislature were so inclined, if you wanted to govern, for example, use of force, much conversation about that right now. One path may be to set out a, a general framework that says uh, police departments and police officers must adhere to the current modern standard. And uh, the, don't get hung up on the language. I'm just I'm, I'm explaining a construct, not necessarily how it would be framed. Um, you must adhere to the current modern standard. It must be uh, a statewide standard, not nuanced for all 251 of our communities. And in the absence of that, you are not eligible for uh, state grant funding, funding that flows through the state. And I would go as far as to say, you're not eligible to send people to the police academy or to obtain training from the state if you are not in compliance with whatever those standards are that the, uh, that the legislature or the Criminal Justice Training Council uh, set forth as the, as the minimally viable uh, product. So there is a way to create requisite oversight um, using our governance structures uh, if we're nuanced about it, that also doesn't inhibit future progress. So I was going to make that point at the end, but since you brought it up, um, we've been doing a lot of thinking about that in, uh, in recent months. So with that- uh, Thank you. And I just will throw- can I throw in one more one more thought here? Is for people who are watching and um, listening, the when we divide this up into the categories, the the solutions and the recommendations within those categories will not be limited to what's coming from this draft. We're getting um, recommendations from many many places, and I, I forwarded to the committee members. And I think maybe it was posted a list of some of them that we've gotten so far. So when those suggestions fit into the specific category, we'll be taking them up along with the other recommendations. Just wanted to make that clear that we weren't, we aren't responding just to this document. So commissioner, sorry about that. Thank you, no problem. Uh, I'll make a, a, a footnote. Uh, I'm not sure I'll get to that list that the, the committee's posted, but we've gone through that list as well. And um, I believe we concur with 80% of what's there, have questions on about 15%. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are a couple that um, I think we have some other ideas on how to execute, but with just about 100% of what's been, uh, been suggested, I think uh, there is a way forward. Um, so with that said, um, mm -hmm. Training is, uh, needs to be modernized. And we've been talking about this since January. Uh, there's a variety of additional uh, training that's needed. We need different delivery models. Um, and uh, you know, there's just a lot of work to be done here. And we've outlined a number of uh, potential action steps that are here. And I know that there's some others that have been inbound from the community as well that uh, are interesting. So. I'll just leave it at, uh, there's a comprehensive uh, training modernization emphasis that we believe is necessary. And with a new executive director uh, at the academy who will be hired in the not too distant future, um, we have an opportunity there. Promotion and supervisor selection, very similar to hiring. Uh, we've got to promote and make sure our supervisors are doing, uh, we're, we're promoting the right people with the right skill sets, that they have the right emphasis, uh, the service emphasis that we want, that they embrace um, fairness, equity, uh, treating all with dignity and respect as a core uh, value. And then we go on to outline a number of strategies, including community engagement, both for the hiring process and for the promotional process and community involvement uh, to do those selections uh, as the model for how it should be done statewide. I also should have noted from the outset that there are a number of agencies around Vermont that do many of the things that are in this strategy where we're really trying to go is to make this You're the uniform. Out. Apologies, uh, it's the internet, I imagine. Commissioner, you, you, know. you, yeah, you're beginning to sound like some, like R2D2 or C3PO, one of those. I'm not sure which one. Well, I'm as long as it's a Star Wars analogy, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah that this is, uh, these strategies are about ensuring a uniform approach 
by all organizations in Vermont. So we don't have many different ways of doing business, but there is a single best practice playbook that we are all using. Um, that is one of the most important pieces of these puzzles. So on promotion, very similar to, to the hiring process in, in terms of the needs and some of the action steps, uh, select the right people, get them into the right positions so that you're institutionalizing the best practice for supervisors. Um, improper conduct allegations, there's a number of things here. Really, uh, again, the, the optimal term here is modernizing. Uh, looking at ways to do early intervention when officers or employees uh, seem to be straying from the community standards, uh, ensure that we're taking care of employees so that they can take care of the public. Um, and uh, really, I think the glass breaking part of what you'll see here on this page is um, we've got uh, unanimity, uh, including, um, I hope I'm not overstepping, but uh, we've had preliminary conversations with the Troopers Association around the need for statutory reform uh, regarding uh, release of misconduct allegations um, and the grievance process and, and the, to, to free up uh, the ability to have more of that information be public facing uh, in the interest of transparency and building trust with the community. So um, that is an area that is a departure from um, where we have historically uh, uh, been on those on those issues and then again there's a number of action items that are starting points for how we actually execute that particular strategy data we've been talking about since uh early this year we are about to select a new or a vendor i don't know whether it'll be a new or our existing vendor um for a computer-aided dispatch and, and records management system that our plan is to uh, deploy statewide. And uh, if you'll recall, part of the modernization strategy is not to charge agencies for that, uh, in large part because we want to be able to do reporting on anything and everything that's in that system with the exception of personally identifying information uh, on a statewide basis. So not only race data collection statewide for traffic stops, which is currently in place, but the ability to drill in to data and have easily accessible public facing dashboards of what's going on with uh, policing in Vermont and the calls for service that we're responding to and what's happening on a statewide basis in a uniform way. And also be able to collect and report that data out in a more raw fashion so that researchers, um, folks that uh, want to do research in our communities, uh, the legislature, whomever can take that data and unpack it in their own way and, uh, and do research on it without having to jump through hoops uh, to do so. So uh, that is an active project that is, uh, is moving forward now. The sixth area is body-worn cameras. Um, we have committed to this this year uh, with the state police. We do have the funding necessary to pull this project off. We are about to select a vendor um, on a statewide basis. Uh, both the chiefs and sheriffs and the Criminal Justice Training Council are calling for uh, statewide body cameras, a statewide policy that governs their use, including a policy that is uniformly addressing the release of footage to the public. Uh, the, this, if there's one on this page that has a little asterisk next to it, it's this one because it will require an investment of some kind. Uh, we need to identify the scope of need for agencies that do not have cameras now uh, and the technology to support those cameras, including the cloud storage. And so this one, um, it, it is a little more difficult to uh, put a specific timeline on other than to say we're, we're working to accelerate it as, as fast as possible. And relative to the state police, the largest agency, uh, that project is moving forward rapidly. Community collaboration is the seventh area of focus. Um, there's been a, a significant focus on this already, but this is a commitment to redouble those efforts and to modernize them as well, to develop, develop additional models for how agencies can collaborate in hiring, training, promotion, policy development, community education about what law enforcement does, the accountability and oversight process. All of those things should have some uh, intersection uh, with the community. Because as I said when, when we started, 
uh, our police departments, whether they're at a state level, a county level, or a local level, are extensions of our community. We are working um, with the community to achieve safety and health. The eighth area is community oversight models. Um, I'm not sure that uh, at the state level, we want to specifically prescribe how communities do this, but we uniformly um, agree that there should be community oversight of each and every department, uh, including input, and, and this weaves into number seven as well, uh, hiring, training, promotional process, policy development, and accountability and discipline. And the thought here at the moment is that we could develop a, a variety of different mechanisms depending on the size of the community and the community's mm -hmm. desire uh, for communities to adopt uh, relative to, to how to do this. Number nine is policy. And there are a variety of things in here. This particular portion is focused on use of force policy. And I understand that the Judiciary Committee will be spending time on this rather than government operations. So I won't read you all uh, the sections, um, but suffice it to say there is a, a comprehensive set. Um, we believe it's a comprehensive set. There may be a few things that we have left out, um, but the most comprehensive set that I've seen in 30 years of, uh, of improvements and modernizations to what, again, we anticipate should be a statewide uniform use of force policy. And we do call out at the bottom uh, here that failure to adopt this model should result in limitations on state funding for the agency that fails to do so. And as I said in the beginning, uh, part of the evolution of this thinking is around whether there are other policies or other um, specific operational parameters that should be part of that as well. That you're, uh, it, think of it like uh, federal highway dollars. You have to prescribe to certain parameters in order to be eligible for them. Um, we're suggesting something similar. And then the... So, uh, go ahead. I, I'll be super brief on the last one. Um, we've heard from the community the, the need to address uh, military equipment. Um, uh, just note that there, there are no dollars, uh, no state dollars used on military equipment. The state police administers this program. There's very little uh, military surplus equipment coming to Vermont. It typically is technology, radios and things of that nature. There are some rifles in Vermont uh, that are used for things like responding to active shooting scenarios, school shootings, things like that. Uh, but there's, it, we're not like some other states. There are not, uh, local agencies don't have tanks. Uh, I think there's a couple of boats out there uh, for marine operations and mm -hmm. search and rescue and things like that. Uh, and we'll add some detail here, but we wanted to uh, at least address it, especially in the wake of the protests in Washington, DC and some of the conflation around uh, the use of the military and that kind of equipment to respond to protests and demonstrations. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask the committee if they have any questions or comments, but I'm going to just make my little pitch here around, and I do this all the time. And so everybody's heard it before, and um, it we usually do it anyway, even though I object. Um, but I, I have a real problem with model policies. Because in my opinion, to, w the way to develop a policy is to say, you, here are the 10 things you have to address in your policy. Here, here's how you have, you, you need to address these 10 things. And then let the, whether it's a school around a lunch program or a police department around uh, you, um, whatever policy it is, um, grapple with those 10 issues and come up with their policy. And because it's way too easy for an agency to just adopt a model policy without having the, the conversation about what does that really mean for us and how does it affect the way we, we operate. And so I, I, I don't like model policies. And I know that one example was when um, we did the one around fair and impartial policing and the uh, immigra immigration. Our <laughs> sheriff's department had a real hard time at one point getting theirs adopted because they had in their general policies, they had um, a policy around um, 
how to treat community members and how to be fair and always working with community members. So they didn't put it in their fair and impartial policing policy because it was already in there. So then they were dinged for not having it in that policy. So my, I, I have real problems with it, but I understand we'll go forward and we will have model policies and I'll keep saying why I disagree with them. Yeah, I, I appreciate that, Madam Chair. I um, I think we're actually suggesting, and I, I, I may be conflating the term uh, model in my description. I think what we're actually shooting for is a singular statewide policy, not a model from which individual agencies craft their own structure. Um, these oh, are see. things that should be universal in their application to all Vermonters. The way force is used in uh, I know Chief Perkel's on the on the line, so I'll use Manchester as the example versus where I live in Burlington. They should match. They should not be different. So this is uh, an inflection point where uh, I think we're all on the same page to go to not just models, which were that was an iterative step. You're we're at the stage where single policy. Did I lose you? No, I no. can't. Okay. Uh I think uh, he's. I could hear him. I fine. think we've almost lost you. Yep. Not no, me. I think it's on your end, Madam can Chair. Can you hear him? Yes, yeah. we can hear him fine, uh, very well. Oh. oh. But he's not saying anything at the moment. No, I'm. I'm silent right now. Um, I, I was done. Brian. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, Commissioner, I just want to thank you for uh, on very short notice coming up with what I think is a very uh, great jumping off point. I think you take into account many of the uh, issues that we will be dealing with in the next two or three weeks here. Um, I did have a couple of, uh, well, I guess one question and one comment. Back on the hiring um, practices portion, I know at one time, and I'm speaking probably just of the state police, there used to be a physical requirement. <laughs> Unfortunately, I'll be very honest, it probably would have let me out of it because uh, I think you had to be a certain height. Um, but there's no mention of having people be in relatively, however you define that, good physical shape. There's the uh, emphasis on a new psychological test, and I think that's a great idea. But I certainly don't think we want people who are challenged physically to, uh, to be I'm probably not saying that in the best possible way, way but you know what I mean? Agreed. Uh, we are using a, a reasonably antiquated system right now. We don't call it out in this particular document. Uh, I know that we are looking at modernizing the physical fitness test so that we're getting people that are in shape, but that we are broadening the ability to hire from a wider cross section of the community. And, and actually, uh, uh, I don't know that it's finalized yet, but the we're looking at a model that is used by the by some other agencies nationwide and using uh, equipment that's built here in Vermont with Concept2 and actually using a rowing machine as the method of assessing fitness rather than the uh, more traditional push-ups and sit-ups and bench presses and, and things like that. That's great to hear. Uh, the second, and I'll, this is just a comment, thank you very much for your emphasis on transparency. I see John Flowers is with us. Uh, I had a brief discussion with uh, Mike Donahue last night, and um, it's good to see that you're at least aware of uh, the advantage of having some possible changes in uh, the way the general public learns about uh, improper conduct. Um, again, we have to be careful just that the spurious allocations don't get reported, but if there's been an issue and a resolution and someone found at fault, I do think it's important for the general public to know that. And I congratulate you on at least being willing to tackle that issue. Thank you. I do anticipate that's something we will need legislative assistance with. Uh, and it, just to elaborate very briefly, I, I think you're right. There are, there are instances that do not belong uh, necessarily in the public vein when there are um, you know, social media posts that are detrimental or calling out something that doesn't turn out to be accurate uh, or other instances where people are just throwing allegations out that have no substance. There's a middle ground also where, um, you know, communities, uh, I think, 
um, we're, we're going to have to find a way to ensure that there's an acceptance of an error rate. Um, I'm not talking about catastrophic error where people get hurt or killed. I'm talking about we employ humans. We're not going to be at zero errors. And we do need latitude to both educate and sometimes discipline uh, employees without that adversely impacting them from a public perspective and also not adversely impacting them from a career perspective long term. People are going to make mistakes. And then there are a, there's a category of things that are just completely unacceptable. And um, if they are fatal to someone's career by design or they're fatal because the community standard is evolving, and that's a side effect of the job that you've chosen to do. But we will need a lot of help in trying to, uh, to, to figure that out, making sure that we're balancing support for employees who are doing a very difficult job and there are going to be errors made and holding people accountable. Thank you, Commissioner. Chris? Um, I wanted to ask about, uh, it's probably inherent in the, the outline you've brought, which is very helpful. Thanks for doing that. Um, one of the things that's come up is if there is um, that newer law enforcement officers learn from their more senior, more experienced people, and if they're witnessing something that is contrary to their training, they're, they're also not in a very good or comfortable position to object because this person has some sort of supervisory control over them or could affect their career, et cetera. Um, is, that, is that tough situation gonna be addressed in the, in the work you're planning? It is uh, both in, and it's, it, it'll take a, a while to ensure that we're there, um, but, uh, supervisor selection is one of those things. Um, ensuring that we're selecting people that are uh, comfortable intervening when things are at a low level and or at a high level, but but it's harder actually for field supervisors for those those first line supervisors. Whether you're in manufacturing or you're in uh, customer service or you're in policing, that transition when you're that first level supervisor is arguably the most important thing that we select because those are the folks that are setting those cultural norms. They're the ones that have to challenge the, both the young uh, folks that are coming on and some of the older folks that have been on for a while if they're doing things that are out of bounds to, that they have to be comfortable in doing that. They have to have the skills and the abilities to do those interventions because, before they become more substantial. And then one step before that, we have to hire people that are willing uh, to raise their hand and speak up and get involved. That actually is less of a challenge today. Um, you know, a lot's been written about the millennial generation questioning everything. In this conversation, that is a good thing. Thank you. Anthony, I keep, I keep <laughs> muting myself just so that- You're trying to talk and you're shutting yourself down at the same time. Yeah. I, Commissioner, I know this is a, this document is a draft and it's beginning of a process that will go on for some time, but I'm wondering if how much you involved sort of the community groups that are on the on the ground level working on these issues involved in, in developing this initial document, whether you met with the social justice groups, racial justice groups, things of people of that sort, or just, you know, wh where you've gone with that process so far. We have uh, a number of them, um, but important to note that they're just a cross section of the community, just like we're just a cross section of the community. And I don't think anyone wants to conflate that with, we've gotten plenty of feedback. We've run it by X number of people, therefore we're good. Um, but it has had the benefit of being viewed through a lens of folks that are outside law enforcement that are embedded in these issues with a different lens, um, at least preliminarily. Okay. Allison. Uh, thank you, Michael. This, just to echo uh, uh, Brian's comment, th th this is a, a great launching point for us and, and very, uh, lots, very lots of stuff to chew on. I'm just curious, you've been involved in other uh, law enforcement departments, and uh, I'm just curious, a lot of culture changes involved in this. How long, how long do you anticipate culture change to take? How long does it take? For culture change to occur in a department? Uh, I think culture change for humans in any organization typically takes about a decade. But the good 
the, the silver lining here is that this is not the beginning. Right. We're somewhere in the middle uh, of substantial culture change. And the goalposts continue to move as we learn more, as the community uh, engages more, as the social norms change, the goalposts move. And that's a good thing, not a bad thing. Um, so it elongates the, the time for full culture change. Um, the other thing I would note is that uh, that culture change, it, there's a million police officers in, in the United States and about a million encounters a day with citizens. Um, what policing looks like in Minneapolis or somewhere else in the country bears very little resemblance to the way it does here. Um, for no other reason than what the, the, com the community standard, the social standard, that what our communities expect of us is different. And so the type of culture change that's required, it's important to note, we're not, I'm gonna pick on Minneapolis for obvious reasons. We're not trying to get from where they are to where we need to be. We're trying to get from where we are to where we need to be, which is a far shorter playing field than in other places in the country. I think that we can also, um, that a lot of culture change depends on the leadership. And we saw, for example, when um, Secretary Minter took over the transportation agency, their culture change there happened pretty rapidly. Um, so I think that it depends on leadership, not only uh, the kind of acknowledged leaders of the organization, but um, one of the things in Minneapolis that we've heard and around the country in lots of places is that the police unions are very counterproductive in changing the culture. And I don't think that's, I haven't seen that in Vermont. So I think the union leadership is also important here. Uh, agreed. Um, I would call out a couple things here. Um, I don't think that the unions are as entrenched in, in the old ways of doing business. Uh, the Troopers Union in particular that I've worked with for the last several months is incredibly professional uh, and forward facing uh, and does a great job at trying to balance the needs of uh, protecting employees with the needs to hold folks accountable and to, uh, to be accountable to our communities. Um, so I think again, it's, it's a much shorter field uh, to use the football analogy um, at the same time, uh, this is also a good point to call out this. I didn't draft this by myself. Uh, the state police, uh, the colonel and, and his command staff, Chief Brickell um, from the, the chair of the Criminal Justice Training Council, uh, Chief Merkel and Sheriff Bonyak from the associations, um, Chief Burke in South Burlington, Chief Morrison in, in uh, Burlington, uh, Sheriff Anderson, all have, and, and they've all communicated with their groups and provided feedback as well. So lots of different avenues uh, for getting this together. And there really is, a, a, I believe, a coalescence of leadership uh, to move the ball forward like I've not seen before in, in 30 years. Well, we, we hope that they've been communicating with their members to people on the ground. I mean, because when you mentioned the list of people you just read, read off or thought set off, I mean, it was mostly the chief this and chief that. I don't mean to be overly critical. I just want to make sure that we're talking to the people on the ground who are actually doing the work. I'm not, and I'm not insinuating you're not planning to do that. I just want to be clear on that, that that's a concern that I have. Understood. More questions or comments for the commissioner? And we will make sure that, um, you are invited to all of them with an agenda of what we'll be taking up and um, all the information that everybody gets and feel free to join us whenever you can. And if you can't, if somebody else does, and I see that we have both Chief Brickell and um, Colonel Birmingham with us today also. So we're going to make sure that we have people joining us. And we've sent, we sent out actually a huge invite list today Gail was quite nervous about it and how to uh, manage it from behind the scenes. So, I, I saw the any more questions? Trying to choreograph. Thank you for uh, for fitting me in at this time, and I look forward to working with you and all of our uh, communities uh, on this topic. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, um, Betsy Ann, are you with us? Oh, and Brenda's with us too. Yay. Yeah.
Uh, we get double, right. double, double Got here. To see Bryn. We haven't seen Bryn for a long time. Yes. I'm going to yield to Bryn because uh, Bryn is one of our judiciary attorneys and specializes in uh, justice issues in the judiciary system. And she actually wrote all of you a memo that summarizes the recent legislation and issues of <laughs> racial inequity and use of force. So I'm going to turn it over to Bryn. And I believe it is. It's posted. It, it, it is posted. It is on our website. And um, so anybody can see it. And so Bryn, if you would like to go through kind of what we've done up to this point. I mean, as we said before, this is not a new, something that just caught us out, out of the blue and said, oh, we better deal, we better do something. We've been working on this for a long time. So if you can just kind of run through that. And I'm going to put myself on mute because apparently I'm causing some echoes or freezings or something, and I, we're having some kind of a little storm outside. So, Anthony, if you, um, I'm going to put myself on mute. So, if somebody needs to be interrupted and I can't get to it, would you you're, do that? You're fine now, Jeanette. I mean, it's fine. Yeah, I think part of your problems is you're just thinking you're having problems. We're not sensing the problems you're having, but that's right. okay if you want to sit quietly. <laughs> Okay, um, I'm going to jump in. Um, good afternoon, committee. Bryn Hare from Legislative Council for the record. Um, I'm going to start off by saying that I have another meeting to that I have to move to um, at three o'clock, so I can't stay for too much longer. Um, and I apologize for that, but hopefully I'll be able to just run through this memo and you'll also have the memo available to you to look at um, if you need some more detail. Um, and one other thing I want to say is that my, the wind is blowing at my house, and so I keep getting an internet connection as unstable message, so please somebody let me know if I'm cutting out and I'll shut off my video, and hopefully that will help. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, um, so the memo uh, sort of goes through some legislation that the General Assembly has passed over the last uh, three or four years. Um, it provides some detailed information about that legislation that addresses, um, takes some steps to address racial inequity um, and the use of force by law enforcement officers in Vermont. Um, so the first act that the memo discusses is Act 54 from 2017, which created the racial disparities in the criminal and juvenile justice system advisory panel. Um, and you've probably um, heard about this advisory panel. They do quite a bit of work in the state um, the bill tasks them with doing a whole list of things, including consulting with stakeholders and its work to essentially do kind of constant review of the criminal and juvenile justice systems and providing recommendations to the General Assembly about ways to address racial disparities that exist in those systems. They're also tasked with continually reviewing uh, the traffic stop data that's um, legislatively required to be collected by law enforcement. Um, and in that review, they're sort of tasked with monitoring progress towards a fair and impartial system of law enforcement. They're also a big part of their work is to um, provide recommendations for um, implicit bias trainings to um, stakeholders across the spectrum from correctional officers and judges and attorneys to law enforcement um, and other individuals <clears throat> in the criminal and juvenile justice system. They also receive reports from the Criminal Justice Training Council on, um, on whether or not the council has adopted and implemented um, those implicit bias trainings for their law enforcement officers. The act also made some amendments to the fair and impartial policing policy. Um, and this committee will probably remember we've, um, you've worked on the fair and impartial policing policy um, over the years, and it sets out that um, model policy, and it sets out sort of a, a procedure by which the model policy is amended and updated, including um, and a process by which uh, the policy can be um, influenced by stakeholder groups. Um, so there was some additional modifications to the um, to that fair and impartial policing policy in. Act 54. <clears throat> and then the bill moves on to talk, or the memo moves on to talk about um, uh, Act number nine in 2018. And I'm sure this committee remembers its work um, 
on that bill, which was to create the five-year position in the executive branch for the executive director of racial equity. And that position is tasked with advising the governor on strategies to remediate systemic racism in state government. And the memo also talks about S338, which is um, the justice reinvestment bill, which is uh, currently moving through the process. Um, it just passed second reading um, today on the house floor, I believe. So that one section of that bill requires that um, advisory panel, the racial disparities in the criminal and juvenile justice system advisory panel, um, the executive director of racial equity, along with other stakeholders in the criminal justice system uh, to work with a crime research group to um, identify existing data and gaps in that data that are related to demographic factors and sentencing outcomes and to identify what additional data resources and staffing would be necessary to fill those gaps in the existing data and report back to the um, Justice Oversight Committee in October of this year. It also directs the Vermont Sentencing Commission to take that um, information that was gathered by the stakeholders and to consider it and to um, come up with a recommendation about whether um, changes to Vermont's sentencing structure are appropriate and consider issuing some non-binding binding guidance for offenses that, uh, for which there exist racial disparities and geographic disparities in sentencing. And they're tasked with reporting back to the legislature in February of next year. So then the memo kind of moves on to talk from the racial disparities um, question to the use of force uh, by law enforcement. So it talks about Act 56 of 2017 um, and that was the act that expanded the disciplinary authority of the Criminal Justice Training Council over law enforcement officers. So it broadened the definition of unprofessional conduct <clears throat> to include both biased enforcement and excessive use of force. And also I'll note that as, as you know, the, this committee recently voted out a bill to broaden that definition even further to, ex to include a first offense of excessive use of force as a category B um, conduct. Act 56 also expanded the authority of the Criminal Justice Training Council to impose sanctions for unprofessional law enforcement conduct. So the next bill that the uh, memo talks about is, or the next act is Act 180 of 2013. And um, that was um, the act that required the Law Enforcement Advisory Board to establish statewide policies concerning the use and calibration of um, electronic control devices, which are also known as tasers. Um, it specified a number of provisions that have to be included in that policy including the standard for when an electronic control device may be used. And it required all law enforcement agencies and officers to adopt that policy. And all officers who carry the device, devices were required to see, receive training by that act. And also all officers, regardless of whether or not they carried a taser, <clears throat> were required to receive more general training concerning mental health issues. And then lastly, it required that all uses of those electronic control, control devices be reported to the training council, which had to in turn report that information back to the General Assembly each year. So that is kind of a summary of the, um, of the relevant bills that have been passed by the General Assembly over the last few years. And again, the memo provides some additional um, information about each of them. Brilliant. You still have some time, right? You don't have to leave yet. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you could describe a little bit. I like, don't know. What? Jeanette? Is it me? Uh, is it me or did Bryn freeze there? I think it was you. Is it me? Yes. So. Okay, I'm going, I'm going to turn off my video for a little while and see if that helps. I don't okay. know what's going on. Okay. Okay. Brynn, I was wondering if you could describe for me like what a use of force policy looks like. I mean, 
is there a way to give a description of what 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 would it include? So are you talking about the use of force um, policy that is currently in front of the Senate Judiciary Committee? Well, a use of force policy in general. I mean, I'm, I'm not, I don't want to pass judgment on whether the one before the committee is good or bad or not so good. What should it include, uh, you know, if you were going to design a use of force policy? Well, typically, um, it describes the, uh, what the standard what the standard is for a police officer to use force within certain circumstances. So for example, it will um, use a reasonable person standard, what, um, what type of force can be used based on a reasonable person's understanding of the situation that's facing the officer. Um, and you know, it could also describe what uh, an excessive use of force would look like or um, what circumstances would allow for an officer to to use deadly force. So those are just some of the some of are, some of the things that you could consider in that policy. Are there states that have are seen as leaders in this? Do you know uh, models that we could look at? Maybe you've already done that. I'm just wondering because our committee is not. There are there are um, there are several states that have sort of a statewide policy on the use of force and. I could um, I could work to gather some of those for for the committee if you'd like to take a look at some examples. Oh, is that being worked on in the judiciary committee though? Um, it's I I have some examples of of different state policies on use of force. Again, they 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 can vary based on whether they're specifically about use of what what is excessive force, what's considered excessive force, or what is like an allowable use of force or use of deadly force. So it's kind of thing where there's yes. always going to, I'm sorry, go ahead, Jeanette. It, it is being worked on in judiciary. The, the way we divided this up is that um, uh, Senator Sears is kind of taking on the model policy around uh, use of force. And we can bring it in here. We just, just barely started it today. I'm also wondering how we're doing just change over to the data data gaps. Are we still doing, are we doing a good job in terms of collecting data or do, are there still gaps we need to work on? You know, I might not be the best person to answer that question, but I, I, I think that you're hearing from a lot of witnesses over today and tomorrow who can answer that better than I can. Okay. Any other questions? Brian? Thank you, Anthony. It's not really a question for Brian. I know she, it's three o'clock still. So. She's got a, a skedaddle, but it it occurred to me when we were looking at Act 54, which is the uh, advisory panel, the racial disparities in the criminal and juvenile justice system advisory panel, which currently numbers 13 members, that one of the people that's not on that is Susanna Davis, because probably when we passed that, that, uh, that executive administration position wasn't in existence. But we probably ought to look to add her to that panel. Just to yeah, I, mean, I agree. Anything else? We can let you go, Brent, if you got to go somewhere. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, committee. Talk to you later. See you soon. No, that was my only thought there, Anthony. Thank you. My phone just went on by itself. Weird things going on. Siri just started talking to me. Hi, Betsy. Do you want to add anything to what Bryn was, Bryn was saying about the memo? You think she covered it all? Of course, yes. I, if I'm here for backup, I'll keep track of things um, that are within Bryn's practice area. Um, but if you have questions about some of the actual GovOps bills that I've handled for you, the, the main one was Act 56, which really reformed the professional regulation of law enforcement officers. So I'm here for backup. And if I can answer any questions about that, if you have any. I just lost you all completely. Senator Bray. Jeanette, you. we heard you. Um, I have a, so Betty Ann, is there anyone in ledge council who, um, uh, Senator Polina just asked a question I had that's the same question about data, data completeness and all the rest. And since we're trying to drive consistent reform, if we don't get good data, it's hard to know how well we're really doing. 
uh, and it also limits transparency, which is of interest to people, to everyone, I think. Um, is Are you or someone else in Ledge Council monitoring as part of your work with committees, our progress on that? Or um, Bryn said we might have witnesses who can speak to that point. I don't know who that would be precisely. On data collection generally? Yeah, yes, yeah. I mean, for instance, um, when Bryn walked through her memo, she was talking about um, the Vermont Human Rights Commission. Well, let me see. There's so many commissions in this paragraph. <laughs> Responsibilities of the panel in, re include reviewing and providing recommendations to address systemic racial disparities and statewide systems of juvenile, uh, criminal and juvenile justice. Uh, also continually reviewing traffic stop data required by 20 VSA 2366. Yeah, so specifically in regard to that 20 VSA 2366, that's the uh, race data collection. Um, and in that, um, in that statute, every state, county, and municipal law enforcement agency is supposed to collect roadside stop data. And then those agencies are supposed to work with the Criminal Justice Training Council um, and the council has a vendor that it chose to, as I understand it, to collect the data. And then that data, as I'm reading through this statute, is supposed to be provided in electronic format that's posted electronically in a manner that's analyzable and accessible to the public on, um, online. So that, that should be um, public data that we can find now. I'm not exactly sure I, where that data exists. Oh, Senator. I, what? I think that the, um, I think that the vendor has not been chosen yet, that there, um, there is some consistency now in um, reporting the data and with the two systems that are being used, but the vendor that's going to be chosen to actually collect the data and aggregate it and make it available has not, I think that Commissioner Anderson said that they're just about to choose a, I, I mean, Commissioner, I'm sitting here looking at Mark Anderson. I said, Commissioner Anderson, I meant Commissioner Sherling, but um, I think Mark Anderson actually is um, right up on this issue. So would you like to answer the question? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. So uh, Mark Anderson for the record, Wyndham County Sheriff, the, uh, Two things about the, the collection, and I understand it's a judiciary bill, bill, so I'm happy to answer questions, but I'm gonna speak to it very quickly. Uh, there's, the judiciary bill is uh, essentially putting a consequence, if you will, or uh, a, a punishment, penalty, whatever you wanna call it, uh, for failure to report. Uh, having a bit of a technical background, I've worked with uh, numerous agency heads in trying to uh, come into compliance with this. Uh, part of the problem is simply uh, people don't understand computers and trying to walk people through how to export data from a system. Um, in both uh, record systems, both Valcor and both Spillman, uh, each uh, law enforcement agency retains uh, a right to their, their information, so to speak. So I can't share the Department of Public Safety's information without their explicit permission. Uh, and that's how we maintain openness of, of information sharing. And so the problem is I also don't have the same right to say, hey, I know the Department of Public Safety needs help in, in sharing this information, so I'm just gonna do it out of the goodness of my heart. Uh, so it requires us talking to however many chiefs that there are to say, would you like me to move your data for you versus someone else? Now the Department of Public Safety is not actually the example uh, of an agency that's not reporting. Uh, numerous agencies are actually trying to do that. Uh, some of the work I've been doing uh, is with uh, the vendor that uh, my agency uses, Crosswind, uh, and they're the, the creators of Valcor, uh, to automate the process behind reporting this information. That was a request that was put forward to the Valcor um, Governance Board, which is the policy board that oversees our system. Uh, and so essentially saying, we're gonna give a permissive for all agencies' data to automatically just be handed over to the vendor, uh, which at this moment, uh, Chief Perkel might be able to correct me if I'm wrong on this, but my understanding is, is CRG. Uh, that information is available on their website. You can actually go to crgbt 
traffic.org, I believe. And uh, there's a section called data and all the traffic stop and uh, racial reporting data is right there uh, going back to 2015, I believe. So, so they aggregate the data and put it together? Yeah. Yes, Senator. But you're not, you can't necessarily, it's kind of like what it used to be with health record, health medical records. You can't communicate with others. Everybody's got a different different program not everybody but there's a number of different programs you can't access other data so all the data is accessible um the the problem is is that the uh, movement of data to crg is manual and so that requires knowledge of how to move the data uh, so it's somewhat of an education issue uh, in trying to explain to people who aren't quite sure how to turn on a computer how to construct an email um, I'm hopeful one of the, the things learned out of COVID-19 is actually how to use technology because I'm looking <laughs> for this VCR still. Uh, so anyways. They can't just zoom the information? We're hoping, uh, I helped, uh, I think it was two years ago and last year, I helped several agencies uh, do it when they learned that I could do this. Um, so I helped them with their permission to move their data on their behalf. Um, I'm happy to continue doing that, but automating the process. Uh, I mean, we have computers involved in this, the collection of the data. Why not have computers involved in the transmission of the data? Uh, so we're working with the vendors. Uh, my understanding is that that process was uh, very far along and a fairly simple uh, lift for the vendors to do, and it just simplifies everyone's lives. But is that impacting the ability or the willingness of folks actually gather the data? you know, to report what they're finding and out in the field? So that would be uh, a second thing. And I think I would ask uh, the members at CRG to report on the quality of the data uh, because I haven't gone through to process everyone's data. I just, I, I transmit it. Uh, mm -hmm. The, uh, in my case, um, we have 100% compliance in the, in the data uh, that we collect. I can't speak to every single agency, uh, but in having this automated transmission occur, um, we would actually be able to identify who is not uh, recording the data versus who is not transmitting the data. And right now that's a bit of a murky area. Hmm. Any other questions about data or anything else? No. Chris? Yeah, um, Sheriff Anderson, could you just say a little bit about the timeline for resolving this and getting, you know, what you would call a from your point of view, sort of a fully functional system up and running smoothly for everybody? I uh, can't answer that at this moment, Senator, but I'd be happy to get that answer and report back. Okay. I mean, I don't know if there's a project deadline and someone said by uh, September 1st, we're planning on having everybody in, or this is just sort of a rolling issue and you're bringing on people as, as they become more interested in participating. The, uh, the conversation, uh, the most recent conversation occurred after, I believe it was January 1st of this year. Uh, and that was because January 1st becomes the deadline when, or the, the bookend of when this information for each year is captured. And so it's somewhat of a seasonal conversation that as it becomes, uh, hey, we need to make our report uh, to the council or to CRG, um, then we start talking about it again. This year, obviously we got distracted with other events um, so uh, that conversation uh, has fallen by the wayside uh, from my perspective, um, but I'm happy to, to re-engage that because it is an important issue that needs to be addressed. Um, going back to what we were asking to do, uh, the, the uh, Crosswind, the vendor for that said it shouldn't be hard to transmit that data. Um, there's not much uh, of a technical. Speaking of technical. To do that. Right. Um, yeah, you just froze, Mark. One last quick follow-up is um, in the legislature, I think we try not to ask for data that is not also helpful to the agency or department that's creating the data. You know, it's like, why would there be data of interest to us that might not be of interest to them? You know, so are you finding the data useful and revealing, instructive in some way? Has it been surprising in any way? Or does this just feel a little bit like a task assigned from elsewhere and you have to do it, but it's not that useful? Uh, admittedly, I'll say both. Uh, the information is actually very helpful, especially when we have conversations about what policies we need to change in effect. Uh, to that end, 
um, for me to understand what effects we have uh, in stopping uh, minorities uh, is something that I need to necessarily understand. Uh, the interesting uh, thing in terms of collecting data and uh, just digressing a bit uh, is my agency, we have a very qualitative use of force reporting system, but it's not very good at quantitative data. So I actually can't run a report right this second to say, this is the number of people that I've effectuated uh, uh, non-compliant technique on or used lethal force on. I would have to assemble it manually. The good news for my agency is that we have a very low repa uh, reporting rate of use of force. Uh, so we could actually assemble that fairly easily, uh, but it would be a manual process. So um, when talking about data, uh, it's really important that we, um, we have the systems in place and with race data uh, collection reporting standards, we had to get the systems in place to do that. So the technical uh, bridge that we're talking about right now is the next step. Um, and we're learning over time and we're working with the vendors to, to do that. Uh, to the, the question of, is it a, a task that we need to do? Yes. Um, and in some part, it's because it's based on a statewide standard that we're reporting at the same time, um, but there's nuanced questions. Uh, there was some unsurety about whether it's happening in September. Uh, is that when we're supposed to report based on the, when the statute uh, was enacted versus do we report on fiscal years? Do we report on calendar years? We've all agreed to say, we're just all gonna report on a calendar year because there's not clarity in that. Um, so working through some of those things can um, uh, be tasks that we don't feel that we're the ones responsible for answering the questions and we're the ones responsible for uh, responding with the data to support that. So um, I think with any work, you can consider the a quote unquote task, but I've seen a lot of uh, value and merit in the race data report. Well, I do, Allison, I'm sorry. Well, Were you well, done, Chris? I didn't mean to interrupt. No, well, one more thing came up based on sh Sheriff's response, and that is I hope that as it evolves, that you all will be consulted so that you help shape the data and how the system functions so that over time it becomes as valued by you as by legislators and others. But Thank you, Senator. I, I agree. And actually, uh, to Commissioner Sherling's point, there's 80% that we all agree with uh, and about 5% that we, we have uh, questions, concerns, comments, what, uh, what will you? Um, some of my comments, especially watching the judiciary he hearing today uh, with regards to S219 was, uh, how do you want us to report this information? Because what the way it's currently written, um, I could answer with 1,500 different responses. Uh, so I'd really like to be uh, be able to say this is what would be valuable to us, uh, so that we can work together to codify it in law. Thank you very much, Allison. So Mark, I, you know, every agency has different data that they collect. How does the data interplay with each other and who is the ultimate collector of all law enforcement data? And if one is wanting to look at all agencies in one, I mean, I hate the use of dashboard because I'm not really sure what it means, but in one place, I mean, how does one, where is it all aggregated? So all the information aggregates with uh, CRG, who's the vendor for the council. Okay. And so uh, they have a document called, or I'm sorry, a page, and I'm not sure if, if this is viewed for the public, uh, but I'll send it in chat at least. Um, the, they uh, share that information publicly, it's available all the time, and that is uh, data that's accessible through a uh, Excel spreadsheet. And that aggregate, so that's every agency in, in, uh, of law enforcement in the state is aggregated there? That's correct. Cool. And their website's also accessible through the Criminal Justice Training Council's website. There's a link. I don't remember where it is, but those are uh, two ways. Uh, so it's crgvt.org. And it's the traffic stop and race data collection. Uh, ideally, I think people like pictures better than they like data, but researchers like data better, better than they like pictures. They want to be the ones to create the pictures. So uh, mm -hmm. what's shared with them is the, the raw data. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? I think, thank you. no, thank you. It was helpful. Appreciate it. Um, Jeanette? Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm, 
I'm not sure if I'm the one that's causing the problems here or not. So um, you're not to... come back, and join us. Well, but oh, every I time I it... do, it seems to freeze either you or me. So anyway, here I am. But what um... <laughs> I just wanted, we wanted to talk a little bit about where we go from here, I think. Yes. So what I would like to do is um, look at those kind of um, general areas that um, were defined by by the commissioner. I th and if there are other areas that weren't defined by him that we need to put in here, I think. So he had hiring, training, promotion, improper conduct allegations, um, data collection is being done by judiciary, and um, body cameras for state police is being done by judiciary. We might want to look at um, some get some testimony around body cameras by local agencies and then yes. um, community outreach and community advisory panels. And then the um, judiciary is looking at the use of force policy. But if there are other policies that we want to look at or emphasize in training, they might fit in there. So one of the things, what I would suggest right now, unless and this, we can be open to the, this discussion, is that we, the first thing we look at is the improper conduct, because judiciary is taking that up right now. And I think that there are, there, there are some things in the bill that was proposed to judiciary that I have some real concerns about. Um, and I think that I would like us to take some testimony before so that we can um, help inform judiciary. There were there, <clears throat> um, there were some penalties that were put in there, like <clears throat> if improper, um, ex if improper, what what's the word, uh, conduct, not use of force, but um, is used. There could be a, a penalty, a criminal penalty of up to twenty years in prison. But we haven't have not really very carefully defined use of force. And as um, um, Mark sent me a, a note afterwards that said that really in law enforcement in their training there they talk about use of force as anything is for I mean just stopping somebody on the roadside can be seen as a forceful action by a police officer. Sure. So I think. I would like us to take some testimony on that starting tomorrow and then on the penalties and the discipline that, that we already have through the training council for um, for that. So who do we talk to about that kind of stuff, you think? Oh, well, I think that we send out the, the, um, the list. The usual list. To, and, and uh, Gail, when um, when we sent out the uh, invites for today or the uh, announcements for today, it went to a, a ton of people, to the usual law enforcement people, the media, um, community groups, social justice groups, the ACLU. It went to a number of people, and I think that we would want to hear from as many of them as possible. So kind of what we want to do, if we're going to invite all those folks, we want to maybe present a question to have them respond to, sort of define it a little bit. Yes. What we're looking for. And yes, we need some sort of uniform sieve through which to weigh and measure all the all that we're hearing, because it's a, it's a big, this is a big task. Right. I mean, this is, in the short time we have, this is, this is a, yeah, this is yeah. big. Well, I thought what, what we could do is put all of the um, suggestions that came from the commissioner in a list and all the suggestions that came from us from the various places around improper conduct and sanctions for uh, discipline for officers in that category. And, um, and then have people testify. And I hate to narrow it so much to a, a specific question because there might be things come up that we hadn't 
have thought of or anticipated. Um, but what we're talking about is how do, what is improper conduct? What do we have currently in place that the training council uses to, um, to deal with people who use improper conduct? How does improper conduct get defined? What is use of force? And I think Mark will probably testify in judiciary um, the next time we take this up there. But I'm, I'm concerned about um, some of the language that was in the bill there. And then what kinds of discipline should there be? And how the, um, wh what is the, uh, what is the um, responsibility of the investigating agency to um, the release of information? When does that happen in an investigation and when doesn't it happen? And I think that we could, Betsy's very familiar with the OPR model here and maybe that's a model that we look at. I think that that's already in 124. So, but I, I, I just, I, I don't know, but it seems to me that we, we need to take, we need to look at this pretty carefully. Agreed. I think you're right, Madam Chair. Um, when you mentioned the 20 year penalty, I'm just wondering how it could, how you could possibly define, in other words, if, if an officer handcuffs someone and it's later found out that he or she shouldn't have, is that what you're talking about? That there could possibly be a, a jail term for that as opposed to uh, slapping someone or punching someone or, you know what I'm well, saying? Well, that's why I think that we need to have some um, testimony about what does in, in the police world, what does force mean? And when is it improper use of force? And when isn't it? Because that needs to be carefully defined. And it's, it, it does clearly say that if it causes serious bodily harm or um, death. And I, if there's death resulting, there would probably be criminal charges. Um, and if, but if somebody pulls somebody's arm behind them because they're resisting arrest and it breaks their arm and they lose the use of their arm, is that excessive force that would be punishable by 20 years? I don't know. I, I don't know. That's why I think we have to look at this. I agree. Yeah, there's a lot of gray area. And I, I think Mark um, and I, I would, I, so I think that we should send the invite to all the people that we sent it to today. And, and I'll write a thing that says, and puts kind of these, um, these different suggestions around improper conduct and disciplinary actions and um, the investigations around those into, into the question so people can see kind of where we are. But it'll be up to people to bring us other suggestions and other issues. And I'm, you know, the media may have some, some suggestions and some concerns uh, that they want to bring forward. In fact, he wants to bring one forward right now. <laughs> yeah, John. Where to go? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, so, uh, thank you, Madam uh, Chair. I just uh, wanted, I know you're going to be wrapping up soon, but I wanted to say the Vermont Press Association is concerned about several of the 10 points mentioned, mentioned by Commissioner Sherling on behalf of several part, you know, several parties. The biggest one is number four, uh, ensuring accountability when it comes to improper conduct al allegations, transparency on that score. Uh, there are different uh, standards now for different departments. Uh, there are more than 68 statewide <laughs> municipal departments, and they all operate by different uh, different procedures. Um, and I know Mike Donahue, who's uh, been at this for quite a while, can align some of the cases, uh, the misconduct examples. Um, we're also concerned about training. Uh, the Vermont Police Academy used to have uh, a media relations uh, education process for new troopers. It, it doesn't at this point. Um, and I think it would be very helpful for the troopers to um, get some news about media relations, First Amendment rights, et cetera. 
And, you know, those, those are two things I wanted to mention really quickly. I, I, I do think that, I mean, we will, we will lump kind of training and um, hiring and stuff into a category and, and go more into depth about that. But um, I, I, I might be wrong, but it seems to me that if we're looking at improper conduct and the disciplinary and the release of that information, that that's probably enough for one Friday afternoon. <laughs> Could be. I mean, we might be able to do more, but I suspect a lot of people will have a lot to say about that issue. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Is that? That could be so it. Did, so did anybody, did you read that list of suggestions that I sent out and did anybody have any, um, uh, I have more of them that have come in and I'll send those out also. Um, there, it's, it's a little over, it's a little overwhelming. I mean, there are just so many. Uh -huh. um, should we take a peek at them together? They're posted on our website, I believe, under Jeanette White. Uh, the categories you've identified. Oh, yeah, no, and that, not, those are just the categories. It's not your email. But where it says suggestions, that's the list. There's 25 suggestions. Oh, there it is. It follows. Sorry, page two. Got it. Yeah, so um, these are ones that came from different places. And, and I didn't put them into categories because I didn't have the categories at the time. But I think we should try to to lump them together instead of having somebody come in and testify on, on these 25 things put them into categories, but are there any in here that um, stand out to anybody? I think they're all worth talking about. I would say number 14 is, in, in my opinion, off the, the off not, the radar. Not as relevant. I, mean, I, don't, I don't know how you would do that anyway. I agree. Yeah, no, I, I, I I don't know how it fits in our work either. I don't think it's. I just I just threw the suggestions out that came from some came from the NAACP, some came from the Social Equity uh, Caucus, some um, came from Tim Ash, some came they came from different places, and I didn't attribute them to anybody because I didn't want that to make a difference. That's fine. Number so we'll take. I don't know what number twenty means. Two cameras. Somebody, somebody is suggesting that there have to be two cameras in the cruisers at all time. One of them, I think they said, um, one pointing forward and one pointing at the at the person. Yeah, I mean, I. I <laughs> Every one of them is going to need to be fleshed out in terms of the need, you know, right. the need, what current practice is, what, what, how does it benefit, how we can afford it. I mean, right. there are so many different layers of, of assessing each one of these that it's, um, it, it's sort of hard to figure out how we're going to tackle them until we, A, put them into our, you know, the, 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 the topics that you want to put them in, which I think we need to, to make them digestible because at the moment it's sort of overwhelming. It's, uh, it's a big, it's a big list and a lot of work. And I, I, not that I want to delegate this work, but it strikes me, I'm, I, you know, this is huge work and the work of, of a huge number of professionals in our area, many of whom have expertise in this area. I'm feeling, you know, as if my expertise is, I, I don't have the expertise in large ways to, to anyway, I, forget it. I, it's, I'm not sure what I'm really saying right now. Well, we are the committee that deals with law enforcement. We are, so, and the training of and, law and if And if some of this needs legislation, that's probably where it would come from. Right. But just because I, those 25 things are listed there, does not mean that they all have equal weight and that they all deserve much attention. So 
I'll try to, for tomorrow, I'll try putting them into the category. Are the categories, first of all, are the categories that that were, um, that I, I just stole from the commissioner, are they the appropriate categories? If anybody wants to weigh in on that, on the committee or not? I don't have, I don't have a strong feeling about that one way or the other. They're fine. Uh, I, th I think they're good. And I think they, particularly the, the first, you know, the, some of them, yes, I think they're very good. Uh, but th it's a lot. Uh, anyway. Ryan? You might combine, um, you didn't number them, but the one that says body cams, you could probably put slash equipment and, yeah. and make that kind of one category if you were. Yeah, I think some of these go together pretty nicely, like training and um, recruitment or promotion and stuff kind of. Well, or, or hiring, hiring and promotion. The, the, right. the, the, I think those sort of fit together. Training certainly is its own kettle of fish. But I think we need to address it because um, we, ha we are addressing it. Yes. Oh, training has been one of our major concerns for years. I mean, overseeing the training council is what we do. Okay. Um, so I, I think that we should overnight sort of go through this and, and maybe get, if well, if you want to take a first pass at it, that might be, be great. I'll try to put them into categories and then... <laughs> And some of them are, are a little redundant too. I mean, yeah. I think you'd yeah. end up with fewer. You know, you combine yeah. some of the ideas. I don't think it has to be Although, that overcome. And some of them, like you know, I don't want to, but things like prohibiting chokeholds and knee holds, I mean, that's kind of like a yes or no question. I know there's a lot of debate that would go on around it, but either you you want to move in that direction or you don't. You know. Well, and also you'd want to hear from police about in what in what ways are are any of these. How are they used? How, you know, what is the policy currently on them? Right. Yeah, well, I, I, I don't. Have... This is the one of the issues that judiciary is doing around use of force. Right. Because a knee hold and a choke hold is a, a, a use of force. And the way that it is defined right now in the use of force. So judiciary has a, this bill. Some of it was taken from the California um, proposed legislation and some of it was not. Some of it was just offered by individual committee members. But, but it defi currently it defines use of force, excessive use of force. Uh, it prohibits anything that um, has pressure on the throat, the carotid artery, the nose. It, it's essentially choking things. But as uh, Sears pointed out, that there are also um, force issues that don't have anything to do with choking, but like um, uh, knees on spines is um, that that was um, what the Woodside suit was about. So the Supreme Court has made a decision about some of that and. So that will be folded into it. But so those kinds of things, chokeholds, and I put it on here because it was a suggestion, but I, I think the judiciary is doing that. Well, and yeah. And how does, how does uh, excessive use of force compare to excessive threatening? You know, uh, and, and where is that fine line? Because, uh, you know, there is an, an ex we all feel it when that line is crossed with excessive threat, you know, right. the, beyond the need of the moment. Um, so where does that fit into some of this? Because I think, um, I think that is an issue as well. Yes, but it, I don't think it's an issue we're gonna deal with. I think it's part of the, I think it's part of the judiciary bill. And if I can just, um, share with you one thing that um, Mark, about use of force. He says, um, what type of use of force? Our training teaches that mere presence is a use of force by law enforcement. Right. As our verbal commands, physical, 
restraints, compliant handcuffing, pain compliance techniques, assaultive techniques, and lethal force. I would suggest being explicit on the types of force we're looking to report. All law enforcement officers are trained on a force continuum, which includes escalation and de-escalation from the academy's initial training. So I, I, I it's more complicated than was presented in the bill this morning. So I thank Mark for sending that. Um, I'm going to forward, I'll forward this actually to all the committee members, if that's okay, Mark. Absolutely, Madam Chair. I think Chair Monique was trying to say something, but it's really. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, Madam Chair, just a point of clarification. The House Judiciary, what they meant by um, improper restraint um, in a statute, it, it talks about the neck holds, the uh, cardiac holds. The mm -hmm. That's where they're talking about the uh, 20 years and $50,000 fine. So I just wanted to just clarify that as far as um, the use of force, uh, what they're talking about in House Judiciary today. Yeah, and we're talking about it in Senate Judiciary also this morning. Thank you. Yeah. But I just want to make sure that we, we um, don't, and I, I'm not exactly sure how to say this, that we don't um, fall victim to doing something because it sounds like we're doing something that we instead think very carefully about what we're doing and make decisions that are the, the right decisions instead of, of just um, responding to rhetoric. And there is a ton of rhetoric and a lot of it is well, well deserved. But I think that um, when we continue to talk about events that happened in Minnesota and wherever, um, and then judge our responses around that, that we're making a mistake. So I just, and if you had heard me say that in the late six, the sixties or the early seventies, you, you would never have heard me say that. Although you, although you haven't aged since then, you're just getting wiser. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. You might be surprised, yes. Matt, here, to learn that I was probably in a very similar situation at one time as you were, um, as evidenced by the picture I shared with you of myself and uh, Governor Douglas. Yeah, yeah. We should we should uh, share stories sometime. Yeah. I do have an FBI file. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Um, curious now I mean we know who's responsible for training law enforcement our Vermont uh, training council uh, and, and and the police academy and and they are also they're also charged with with overseeing the their they do all the disciplinary actions as well I, I mean it would be interesting to have a sort of a a, a chart and understanding of of who's responsible for what already within well, the law enforcement world. Well, part of that is in S-124 that we just passed. A lot right. of it is in there because it, it uh, details when, what's a category A, category right. B, category C, who has responsibility, who takes it on, who does it. So and, it's and there. It, it, it is. Um, but it's, it, you know, it's just, it would be interesting to see because we have so many different law enforcement agencies, how discipline ends up coming up the ranks to, I mean, well, may, maybe we, I, I mean, I just, anyway. I think that, that is in 124. Yeah, it, I guess it, it is. It's very clear about when a local um, agency when they defer, begins right. an investigation and when it goes to the academy and when they, I mean, the training council and when they take over and, and, and then there are some interesting things in here like that all, maybe all, everything that in Sherling's, everything that results in, I don't know if he said serious bodily injury, but in death has to be reviewed by the, either the 
uh, right. attorney general or the state's attorney. And I would, so, you know, there are some interesting things in here that we could look at around a discipline. So, okay. So I see that Charity Clark is with us. So um, I'll make sure Charity that you get the information because um, we would, if we're looking at um, improper conduct and allegations and discipline and penalties and stuff, we would want you involved. Okay. So uh, Madam Chair, as much as we've dealt with discipline, I mean, it isn't one of our categories and discipline. Yes, it is. It's called improper conduct. Okay. I mean, so, I, I, that, I put it under there because right? if you okay. have improper conduct, there's going to be some consequences. Be right. Yeah. Okay. So, is it stuffy where you guys are? Yeah. It's really, really humid. So, I think I'm about to perish. I think my bottom is about to have. Complete. We have been sitting for it since 8 a.m. I know. Yeah. So <laughs> anything else this afternoon? Does anybody who's here with us, um, Chief Brickell or Matt or um, Rob Shelley, see is here from Judiciary. Anybody have anything they'd like to throw in today about kind of the process? Hope Because we want to get make sure that we're doing the right process and so we can get everything taken care of. I'm Chair, if I could address you for just a minute. I'm looking at your um, categories for discussion um, or, or your questions for tomorrow that specifically you would like testimony or answers to. Um, I can also request uh, Drew Bloom, who is the lead use of force instructor at the Academy. Oh. So everyone knows exactly the initial training that every officer gets. And it continues once they leave the academy at their own home agency, obviously. But um, it, he would be probably one of the best people just to answer specific questions if there were questions specific to training and use of force. And I, I sent in a chat to you the topics that I thought on your long agenda of 25, um, which would be remain to the council's discussion if those were things that were of interest to you for tomorrow. So. Um, I okay. can certainly let Drew know that um, you'd like him to be available if that's possible. Thanks, and just would you give his information also to Gail so she can send him an invite? I will certainly do that. Thank you. Anybody else have anything they'd like to add kind of on the process? Well, it, Jeanette, is the whole is the hope that our work will be folded in with so that we have one bill on, on this and that no, our work I, will be folded in with judiciary's work? No, I think not. I think that uh, judiciary, he really wants to get this out right away um, because this is around data collection and the deadly or use of deadly force primarily. So he, he wants to get this out right away and if we're ready, we can, he intends on voting it out next Friday and we may well be ready on Friday and then, and then I'll leave that decision up to, to um, Tim who is much smarter at this kind of stuff than I. But I'm not, so I'm not sure what he wants, but I, committee, I, I know this is a huge ask. Um, is there any way we can meet on Monday? And if no, just say no. Yeah. I, Anthony? I, I, I'd be willing, excuse me, I'd be willing to meet on Monday. I'm not going to be here tomorrow. I know. I have an appointment I can't change. Yeah. I'll be here Monday. Chris? Um, I'm thinking because I'm, <laughs> and then we're trying to vote out all our Act 250 stuff and we're talking about meeting on Monday to do that and we're in that you know home stretch of editing five things into one and so um, I'd have to say I'd like to be on reserve okay but, um, because I might really need to be bearing down getting our amendment finalized for a vote the following morning which is sort of pretty much a hard stop for us make those people work 
I'm, can I give you everyone's uh, email on the committee and, okay. Yeah, Betsy Ann, if, if we had to, could you? And Allison? Uh, we would prefer I, not to. Yeah. I, pr I prefer Let's see not how to we do simply because I'm feeling completely, uh, you know, uh, the, the workload in both these committees is, is pretty <laughs> serious. And I need a day to catch up on some of it. And uh, I mean, we have, some of the weekend, but I mean, I'm happy to meet if we have to meet, you know. Let's, wait, let's, let's wait and see. Um, let's um, see where we are tomorrow. tomorrow. Yeah, and then if we can make sure that we meet Tuesday, the, my fear is that Wednesday and Thursday on the floor may take a long time and that we'll lose a lot of time, but we'll see. We can also maybe even put it over until the next week, but we'll see, okay? Okay. Thanks, Anthony, for um, jumping in there. I have no idea what was going on <laughs> with my stuff, but. Um.